programme this week, we're going to meet a dairy farmer who doesn't sell his milk. He's also a dairy farmer with some of the best Frisians in the country. So what does he do with his milk and how come he's got the best Frisians in the country? You'll find out. Welcome to the programme. This week people are talking about such things as New Zealand sending information on dairy farming to Sri Lanka so that they can do better jobs as dairy farmers. Now, interesting point about that, of course, is the fact that we actually sell them product. So why would we be teaching them to come into competition with us? But then, that's another story. Farmers are still pretty grumpy about Fonterra making a huge profit when they, the farmers, are still struggling. They've just been told, basically, that it's a fact of life and they're going to be using the money, as in Fonterra, are going to use the money in debt reduction. Was that really a pea weevil that I ploughed under? That's the question of a Canterbury farmer who's not quite sure if it was. And, but if it was a pea weevil, how did they spread to the South Island and how bad is the infestation? Export of eggs and chickens means that the grain industry is looking pretty good as grain growers can ride on the back of exporting chickens. Shipment to Park and Colonel, uh, stopped by MPI offshore. It's pretty good news for those who are worried about our borders. And bull sales are looking pretty positive as one bull breeder who's got Herefords is putting up 300 bulls because they want to cash in on the number of dairy farmers using that breed over their cows. In just a moment, we're going to be talking animal health, prevention and cure. Nick Camelids. A lot of people won't know what a camelid is, but you <laughs> certainly do as a veterinarian. Yes, camelids. Well, they're, <clears throat> they're, there's four species of camelids, and of course the most common ones that people will, will, will know are llamas and alpacas, because we see them dotted around the countryside these days, and they have, they, uh, a lot of people say they've had their day, they were a bit of a fad for a while, but nevertheless they're still a very common sight, and um, I guess it's a nice opportunity to talk about something a little different and maybe... Uh, maybe bring into the fold some, some lifestylers or some, some people that, are, that might have something to do with us or got a bit of land that want that are interested in, in putting some camelids or some alpacas and, and llamas on, on that bit of land. So what should we be looking at? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of animal health situations, yeah. like castration, for example. Yes, so that, well, they're typically um, very easy animals to look after, and so they do fit a sort of busy person that wants the pleasure of, of having a rural environment around them with livestock, and so they're very easy to, to maintain, but there are some essential things that need to be done. Castration, you just mentioned. Entire males, of course, they can actually end up being quite dangerous, particularly when they um, develop very strong bonds with, with human beings. And so um, these animals, when they lose that kind of fear factor, if you like, they can be very, very aggressive um, to foreign people or other people entering the environment. They're quite protective. And so castration makes these animals much easier to to manage and, and also, of course, controlling reproductively, of course, that, that's, a, that's the other major benefit. It's rather a simple operation. A lot of people, in alpacas especially, a lot of vets will do it standing, so no sedation or no anaesthesia, just a bit of local anaesthesia. Llamas, um, I tend to prefer to do them knocked, knocked right out. They're a bit more vascular and a bit more of a bigger surgery, but still they relatively kick harder. simple. They do kick harder, <laughs> and, and frontwards to the sides and to the back, so you're in a really, really good target zone. Um, and I guess while we're on the subject of, of male animals, fighting teeth is another peculiarity of, of llamas in particular. They're very, very sharp, dangerous, dagger-like teeth at that, that, that um, angle forward, and um, they can be very dangerous to people handling and also other animals around them. Um, they can be used as quite dangerous weapons. And so one of the, the more common things we do is actually uh, remove or saw off those dagger-like teeth. Um, often that's done at the same time as we're castrating, of course. But, um, what about the other teeth? Do they get overgrown? They can, yeah. The incisors um, that they use to, to, to pick, pick at food, um, as the animal gets gets older, they do tend to overgrow, and we end up with a with these teeth that kind of overshoot the the palatal plate, and so they become less effective. And you have these funny looking older camelids with teeth sticking out at all directions, and so it can be quite common um, maintenance. Uh, 
procedure once a year or so or to check those teeth especially in older animals and it's relatively simple to actually grind them back a little bit it's quite simple we use an angle grinder in fact and just make sure that the, the teeth are cooled so they don't get too hot with the friction but uh, we just need to make sure that they're kept back enough so that they don't angle forward and they're kept in contact with the palatal plate to, to ensure the animals can eat properly it makes them look nicer too Exactly. In their natural habitat, of course, there's a lot of hill country and rocks and stuff, but you don't get that on the farm, so no. feet. Yeah, feet, of course, and that's another annual kind of annual doing. And so often when I just mentioned checking the teeth and grinding teeth back if they need be, um, clipping the nails is, is another important thing. And this can be done as an annual kind of group of procedures because shearing is another exceptionally important thing that needs to be done each year. Um, particularly in darker animals and particularly weathered or castrated male, uh, male animals, they have a peculiarity that they can develop rickets and a lot of that problem comes from lack of sunlight and so if they're unshorn, particularly the darker coloured animals, um, they can get rickets and they get very, very sick indeed. Uh, virtually zero phosphate levels in their blood and that's purely from lack of, of active vitamin D. So annual shearing is... a lack of sunshine on the back. Exactly. Very, very important. And in conjunction with that, we like to recommend that coming into the winter periods around the autumn that these animals get given a vitamin supplement which obviously also contains some, some vitamin D to try and help prevent this problem occurring. But the hallmark is actually shearing and making sure adequate levels of sunlight. What about vaccinations? Do you need to do anything there? Well, it's it's uh, it's debatable how ne how needy that is, but it seems to be ad advised, and we certainly advise that clostridial vaccinations, five and one vaccinations, as we advise with other ruminant species, sheep and cattle, um, we advise that that's done um, annually because there is really no indication that they wouldn't be susceptible to tetanus or a pulpy kidney or these type of things. Generally they're managed on much lower quality feeds so pulpy kidney doesn't seem to be a managerial problem or a disease but tetanus I guess could be. What about internal parasites? Yeah it's very unusual to find a heavily parasitized camelid but I have seen them. The ones that I've seen I do wonder I think there probably has been an underrunning problem with their immune systems and they have failed to develop good immune response but it, again it's quite good practice to keep a handle on this and our advice would be at least annually in adult animals just to check some dung samples for parasite loads so for, do a fecal egg count on some some uh, uh, even a pulled sample from a number of animals just to get an idea of what the parasite situation is in that group of animals. Should I ask you about TB? TB testing in camelids is a procedure that seems to be done more commonly probably than it needs to be. I guess we don't know a lot about the disease in camelids, but it seems to be a requirement of uh, a lot of issues when we're using or shifting animals from property to property. It's quite a simple procedure. We tend to just do it like we do in deer actually and do a, what's called an intradermal test um, and you usually do that in the neck. So we're just kind of injecting some tuberculin into the skin of the neck and then reading that test a few days later to see if there's a reaction um, to see if the animal's got circulating antibody to TB which would infer that it's been exposed. Um, I don't think I've ever detected a positive yet but it does something that seems to be done relatively regularly and may need to be uh, contacting vets to, to enable that test to be done. What about other simple diseases? Yeah, they do have peculiarities as, as animals and we do see a couple of things much more commonly than we'd think. One of those is pink eye. They're very, very susceptible to pink eye and I don't think I've ever seen animals get such severe problems and get them get the problem so easily as I have with alpacas in particular. So pink eye is a really, really uh, common problem that we see. And the other thing that we, in, in Canterbury, the region that we're in at the moment, we seem to... Um, not very commonly see um, ryegrass staggers, a fungal uh, a problem caused through a fungal toxin and dead material in the pasture. Camelids are exceptionally susceptible to, to ryegrass staggers and um, they seem to to wobble around and get, get symptoms of this disease when there's no hide nor hair of it in other species. So very, very, uh, a very peculiarity of the, of the animal that they seem to be very susceptible to that particular fungal toxin that causes 
ryegrass staggers. So if there's neurological signs around the winter or the summer months where there's lots of dead material in the pasture, um, then that would be a good a good reason to start thinking that perhaps this is the problem, rather than um, jumping to conclusions of back problems or or sore backs or spinal issues. Yeah. Thanks again, as always, Nick. Still to come on the programme, we're going to be talking about subterranean clover, but not the subclover that you'd expect and know. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try GrowSure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with GrowSure from KiwiCare. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at onthelandco.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Sometimes one thinks that one has probably had enough of minorities making a whole lot of noise and the media backing them. I'm talking about 1080 and when you look at some of the rubbish, in my view, rubbish that is being said by people who are against 1080, I just shake my head and share disbelief. This morning, for example, there was a, a national announcer, for the want of a better term, on a national program, going on and reading out text messages that had come in. And one of them said that this particular person had walked on a track twice of late. The first time, birds everywhere. Second time, not a sound. The place, quote, was dead. The only difference was there was a 1080 drop between the two walks. Now, I've spoken to a lot of farmers, especially on the West Coast, where they have a major, major problem with possums and all that sort of thing. And they will say that after a 1080 drop, the birds start to come back. And then at the point of the third drop of 1080, they say that it's almost deafening with the birds. The people have got photographs of possums, of stoats, of rats and cats eating birds. Now they're the ones that actually are being targeted. Now, the other thing is that if these greenies, or whatever you like to call them, who make so much noise and who are in a very, very small minority, because most of Kiwis couldn't give a damn about what happens in our forests, but if you have a look at what they're actually saying, invariably it is very, very ill-informed. And yeah, we'll see photographs, won't we, of all these Kiwis that have been laid out because they died because of eating 1080 poison. And there's one outfit who actually said that the deer have been slaughtered, they've been dying because of 1080, and there were shots of a whole lot of different deer. Wrong, guys. That particular hind had a very interesting mark on its foreleg, and it was the same hind in very wide range of different areas where it had been dragged and more photographs taken of it. So what I guess I'm trying to say is, if you were to go to these people and say, would you be happy 
if we were to produce some sort of a poison that wouldn't be taken by birds, it would dissolve in water, that it was made out of natural phenomenon, as in natural organic phenomenon, would you be happy? 20 to 1 that they'd say, absolutely. I've just described 1080. Interesting that, isn't it? Andrew, subterranean clover, it's not what it used to be. Subterranean clover captured our imagination a few years ago. I went on a trip to Australia, to, into Victoria, Melbourne, and then up to Adelaide to look at varieties with a company that we, that we do some business with. And I saw these absolutely fantastic bracky type subterranean clovers that were growing up around my knees with leaves the size of, you know, like uh, the bottom of a stubby for a reference point, even larger. And I thought, these are fantastic. We need these varieties in New Zealand. So uh, I investigated and uh, interrogated the plant breeder, Carolyn de Koning, in Adelaide. And, uh, and she was extremely useful. And she told us all of the things we needed to know about introduction of managing and maintaining a stand of, of, of subclover, of a bracky subclover. The variety that we imported is called Antas. Most people think of subclover and they think of a leaf that's about the same size as Marku lotus and very, very low to the ground. Yeah, so you're, that's, you're talking about there, Rob, Mount Barker, which was introduced like over a hundred years ago. In fact, two years ago we had the guys over here and they said, well look, he met a descendant of the farmer who'd originally produced the Mount Barker line of subclover from Mount Barker, you know, near Adelaide. So, but Mount Barker is a very small, low-growing subclover. And its success, its survival, has been pretty much attributed to the fact that it, that it has a very low growing point and it flowers, you know, seeds, and then the birds they bury. Stock were unable to graze all of the flowers or all of the birds. Unlike the, uh, the more recently bred subclovers, they have a higher, a higher growing point, more flowers, and of course stock absolutely love the legume, they love protein, you know. So of course they would graze the flowers and of course uh, regeneration is not as straightforward. So what do you do for regeneration? Well it's quite straightforward really, you know. <laughs> I was talking to Dick Lucas this morning and he said, look I've looked at a farm that we've got who's uh, in the Sustainable Farming Fund in Cheviot, Coromico Farm, and uh, he said, look, I need to get Hugh Crosley to get his stock off because, you know, they're grazing so really simple. Unfortunately, you have to remove the stock any time from about late September, early October, through until the middle of de December, to allow the subclover to, to run, to allow it to flower, to allow it to produce a seed, a burr, and consequently a seed. Now, some of the varieties of subclover, there are three family groups. So there's the brachy. The attribute with the brachy calcinium subclover is it will grow up to your knees with very large leaves but the flowering points are halfway up the plant, so about 12, 14, 18 inches up the plant. So they're in the, well in the grazing zone. The Yeninicum variety and the subterranean, subterranean varieties both bury their seeds 100%, as long as you don't graze them. So their flowering point, they grow along the ground, and so the burrs will bury much easier, you know, much easier. So, you know, it's easier to seed the, the, the Yeninicum and the subterranean. But the bracky variety, of course, gives you huge dry matter and, of course, a lot of feed in the spring. Palatability? Enormous palatability. Stock absolutely love protein. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on farms, particularly sheep and beef farms, occasionally dairy farms, well, quite a few dairy farms. But particularly with sheep, you, you, you follow sheep wandering around, walking around a paddock, not that it's a habit, but, uh, and you do see them nibbling and they're going specifically for the legume. Derek Moot at Lincoln University will say, uh, animals, sheep in particular, preferentially graze the legume. It looks to me, well, very much like red clover, really. It does look like a red clover. I mean, the number one difference is that it is an annual. It's an annual. Red clover is a perennial, so, you know, it will last for up to five years, sometimes three years, but up to five years for red clover. Annual clovers, subterranean clover, belongs to the annual family. It's, it's, uh, it's survival is reliant absolutely completely on the variety's ability to produce seed and to shed seed over Christmas, over the December period, either by burying the burrs, each burr will contain about four or five seeds, or simply dropping the burr on the surface of the soil and then with the little undulations on the burr, the burr type structure burying itself 
And so that's how it gains its, its uh, capacity to fire. But in either, any given year, you know, subclover regeneration will only be 5 to 10 percent of the, of the seed shed and buried and burned. These modern varieties, they can, in Australia, where they harvest them, in the, in the dry, friable country, they can harvest about 1,000, 1,500 kilos of seed to the hectare. We, uh, we own the variety uh, which was bred fodder fodder by Gavin Sheath. We harvested uh, 1,100 kilos to the hectare out, uh, out at Lincoln. You know. So they're big yields, you know, they, they can yield really well. Establishment? Establishment, really straightforward. Uh, this year, unfortunately, we've had, the, we've, in fact, for the last two or three years, we've had the drought in the east coast, north, you know, north and south Canterbury, around about. So establishment hasn't been so straightforward. But what is interesting, Rob, is that, of course, the subclover, it hasn't died because it hasn't grown. A proportion has grown, say 5%, 10% might have struck with the rains in January, then just burnt off and died. But the seed is still on the ground waiting for a, like a, a, you know, a useful rain after Christmas next year. Availability? Really available, you know, like uh, as Vincent has already uh, <laughs> said, you know, we don't like to run out of seeds, so we have lots of stock, so it's in plentiful supply here in Rangiora. So how do people get hold of it? They get hold of it by uh, tracking to our website or looking us up in the phone book, you know, and for ring those us. Old fashioned for people. those old-fashioned people, <laughs> those people who are not so digitally enhanced, uh, you know, not with a dial, of course. But anyway, just ring us up and uh, we can visit and provide you with subclover seed and the advice, the agronomy to go along with managing the crop. Yeah, that's important. It's very important. It's important. One of the things that we've been working with, uh, it, I will confess, it did. You know, we're a little bit old-fashioned here, 1932, but it. Dick Lucas and Derek Moot would, 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 would lecture you and say, look, you must, you absolutely must reduce your grass down to 5, 10 kilos to the hectare. So, you know, it used to be very difficult to sell 25 kilos of grass to the hectare, but it's equally as difficult to get a farmer to reduce their grass sowing down to 10 kilos to the hectare. But we sow 10 kilos of grass plus 10 kilos of subclover to the hectare, and look, establishment is a piece of cake, plus white clover, red clover, chicory plantain. And of course it's a legume? It's, well it produces its own nitrogen. You need to attend to the, to the pea and particularly sulphur. Phosphate and sulphur are important with the legume. But yeah, so tremendous plants. People that grow them absolutely love them. And staying in Rangiora straight after the break we're going to be visiting the Rangiora a and P, who are celebrating their 150th year. Not sure how to brighten up your backyard? Try Grow Sure Easy Flowers, all in one mix. Seed, feed, mulch. It's bloomin' easy. Be sure with Grow Sure from KiwiCare. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. of Rangi or a &P show. It's been a long journey. A very long journey. Yeah, a whole 150 years. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, but you're not the oldest, but you're very close to it. Yes, we're the fourth. 
in the uh, in the South Island. Ahead of us is uh, Otago Tyree, then Canterbury, North Otago, which is Omaru, and then us, Northern AMP. I want to show everybody that because that to me is very, very important. That's that's the medal that all the winners are going to get, the, the top medals. Yes. And the committee as well, I understand. Yes. So you, you've had that minted? Yeah, especially made. Yeah, it's, we're very proud of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, so it should be. And tell me about the Royal event because the, the Royal Ag have acknowledge your 150 years. Yes, um, the, sh the sheep and equestrian, that's a royal event status this year, which means the uh, RAS will come up with medals for the winners and ribbons, which set a say royal event. Because that, it's a big incentive, isn't it, to, to get one of those royal events? Yes, well, the uh, sheep section has uh, doubled in size because of it this year, and the horse section is over 2,000 entries. 2000. Yeah. The Friday is a big equine event. Yes. So that, that's, it's that's ba horses all day? Basically just, yeah, just horses on Friday. Then the Saturday is um, everything, all the other classes and horses. And then this year we're having a Sunday celebration day, which is a lot of the animals have gone home, but it's more vintage theme. And um, they, we've just gone try and celebrate 150 years, which is a big event. Absolutely. That's really when the town folks can, I mean, the town folks want to pour in on Saturday as well. Obviously. Oh, Sunday. Yeah, but Saturday. Sun, Sunday is a huge focus on just, let's have a party. Yeah. Yeah, it's more celebration and it's, yeah, pretty cheap to get in the, the gate. But uh, Saturday will be the show and there'll be the top twins coming. Well, they're always value. Yes. Yes, and they're going to do two shows. And then uh, mingle with the crowd, and um, and just yeah, you know, hopefully it just adds a bit a bit of something to the show. Let's talk a wee bit about AMP shows because Jeffrey, they've been around obviously for over 150 years, but it brings the whole society together, doesn't it? It, br it brings your region together. Yes, and um, that's right. People exhibit, they come along, they talk to people, they judge, and various things, and um, and also some people join the AMP movement and they go through the system and uh, join committees and various things and, and that, and um, eventually some people become president. As, as you know. Yes, <laughs> quite right. Exactly. What's the president's role? Ah, well, it's just to oversee everything and run meetings and, you know, he's well trying to get everybody pointing in the same direction at the same time. And hopefully we get a good show out of it. Yeah, no, it's good, it's good. Yeah. Tell me about the volunteers, because seriously, without the volunteers, you guys just could not operate. Absolutely. Well, we're all volunteers, of course, and um, they, well, they just, yeah, that's how shows operate in New Zealand. It's just people doing their bit, running. Some people will be running the sheep section, some people will be running the beef and cattle section, some people the horse section, um, the home and craft, the dog trials, all sorts of things. And they all just sort of come together and uh, do their sections, and next thing you've got a show. But you never seem to run out of volunteers. Uh, well, that's well so far, but no. But society is sort of changing a bit, and uh, you know, the, the, especially in the Waimak district, a lot of farms have gone now, and it's become more lifestyle orientated. And some of those people, they haven't quite done the full change onto. They can still be part of the AMP. You know, some some have, some haven't. They sort of seem still seem to think it's a more of a farmer type thing, but it's it's totally changing. So what you're suggesting is somebody with a small block or somebody who isn't in, in Rangiora who just wants to get involved can do. Absolutely. All they need is an interest in one of the, one of the uh, parts of the show, you know, whether it's the, the horse section, the, the cattle section, sheep section, the home and craft section. It's all, they're all welcome. Interestingly, though, because you, you, you are sort of a, a progress thing. You come in at, the, at a certain level and you're taught everything, aren't you? Like as a steward and as a judge, you actually get taught and, and ease through it. Y yes, yeah, that's right. Um, my own example was, you know, as a kids, we used to go to the show and all that sort of thing, enjoyed themselves. But as a teenager and a younger adult, you know, we went, I went to some, some shows, <laughs> not all of them, and then um, suddenly we had children and they uh, had pet lambs and my wife said, oh, we've got to put the pet lambs in this year. And so take the pet lambs to the show and exhibit them and that. And next thing somebody's, uh, the next year, 
towards the next show, rings up and says, oh, we need a steward in the sheep section. So, okay, you do that for a couple of years, and then, and then they say, oh, would you, would you like to join the committee? Would you come and join the committee for us with us? And I said, oh, well, okay, we'll have to give that a go. And then after a while, you, next thing you've got another position, and the next thing you're then I asked to become the president. And then they say it's a 150th show. <laughs> yeah, no pressure, Jeffrey, no, no pressure at all. Which is going to be bigger <laughs> and more days. Yeah. But there's also things such as the catering. I mean, there's a, there's a lot involved with that. Yes. Well, feeding volunteers on the Thursday, the main day we set up, um, all the way through the show. And, of course, we feed uh, judges and, the, and, and members. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a lot to bring together. And your secretary should be knighted or become a dame. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, it's the, a tough the, job. The secretaries are absolutely incredible, aren't they? Yeah, and and they know so many people too. You know, and you just ask them about such and such name. Oh yes, that's and they've got it all from the year before, or the years before. And who polishes the trophies? <laughs> well, they're out, they are actually getting polished this year because um, for photos because it is a 150 years. Hopefully we're going to display quite a group of them, but uh, you know it's not the best job, is it? No. <laughs> but there's, you've got all that planning. Again, for example, how many ribbons do you need? Because you just said you've got two thousand horses this year, and you've got to work out how many entries there are, and then that first, second, third, and highly commended. And whew. yeah, yeah, you're right. But of course, a lot of it is the same as the year before, you know, and you know the same classes. You know, there might be more people in each class, but there's still only the same amount of classes, so there's still only the same amount of first, second and third. Fair comment. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a fair comment. When do you start planning next year's one? <laughs> Probably about Monday week. Is no, after no, this. no, it's not quite. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it'll be the beginning of the year, you know, really, that it starts again. But of course, the Ranger Show, though, there's a lot of other things happen. It's, it is the showgrounds, but a lot of other things people and clubs used it. And um, so it's going all year round. And one of the b bigger bigger things to come to Rangura each year is the, the muscle cars in February. There was a huge amount of people coming to the town with care cars, and it must be great for the businesses selling bits and Absolutely, business. absolutely. What we haven't said, Jeffrey, is this is Labor Weekend coming up. Mm. So that, that's, that's the three days of Labor Weekend. Yes, yes. Well, it's, uh, the, it's mon on. the Monday's a rest day. The, thank, thank God. <laughs> it's a drying out day. <laughs> yeah, and but um, the Saturday and the, the Sunday are certainly going to be big days for us. So, and, and the Friday also. So Rangiora, 150 years of celebration, and it's the, the way to spend Labour weekend. <laughs> yes, hopefully. And what we're really after is a nice dry day. A couple, couple of really nice days. Yeah, um, well, we'll do everything we can. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Jeffrey, thank you very much indeed. Have a great weekend, please no, do. Thank you. thank you. Education, Lincoln University, they're now doing what's known as blended education. We'll find out more in just a moment. Lincoln University, now giving students the best opportunity to learn. That's right, here at Lincoln University, we've got a great face-to-face -face, uh, teaching experience here, but we've also got a really good online experience. So we're trying to do a lot more work now with our learning management system where we've got academics who are building these great online learning modules, which our students are doing, say, off-site, and they're doing those materials on the way to, to university. They are catching the bus, doing their, doing their uh, learning on the phone, uh, on their device and coming into class uh, you know already up to speed with what's going on and the the academic is then able to actually um, do a, something a little bit different with the class than just stand and teach. So I guess really it's a case of the research is being sent out online and that gives them an opportunity to do their own research. That's right you've got an academic who is able to actually list um, a whole range of really great teaching resources and put those up online so a student can actually go, okay, this week, this is what I'm going to cover this week. I can actually read my, the lecturer who has got some great experience in this particular area, who's listed a, uh, some kind of online quiz or an online reading for me to go through. So they go through those materials and they come to class all ready to go, all with all that knowledge um, tucked away, ready for debate. Is it sort of homework to a degree? Yes, it is. It is homework, but it, 
we call it a flipped classroom here at Lincoln University. So it's where the, the flipped classroom is. So the students are doing the work prior to coming to class. So instead of actually giving a lecture and then the students going away and doing some work, we're asking the students to actually do the work before class and they're coming to, coming to the class with that knowledge um, all ready to go. So you can actually use that class for a, a different, uh, a, for different, different things. Perspective. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. How's it going down with the students? Are they enjoying it? Well, for the, for the courses where we're using it, it is, it is going down really, really well because this is what education is about. In a modern learning environment, this is what it is about. We've got the kids who are coming up through high school here who are using blended learning environments and now they're coming into university and we're full of it here. So we've got some, some great blended learning environments uh, in each of our faculties here for our students to, to work through. It must be beneficial because in fact they're getting twice the amount of learning that the previous students would have had. That's right, so they're getting the, the full value of the academic uh, in the classroom but they're also getting this great online learning environment which is, which is great because that actually gives them a lot more support and so they can actually come to the class, uh, they can talk online with their, with their fellow students, they can discuss and debate those ideas online uh, and then come to class and, and have another learning experience with the academic who is uh, really experienced at what they're actually teaching you. You've come a long way, Lincoln University, since you're a Lincoln College. Oh, very much so, very much so. Lincoln University has made some really great leaps and advances in the way it actually teaches and delivers its programs. Lincoln University has made some great jumps. So coming to class is really just an added advantage? That's right. With, the, with this blended learning, this flipped classroom model, we've got students who are actually on the farm who will undertake um, a lot of their study while they're actually you know, in between uh, in the dairy um, and then they'll come back uh, onto campus and actually undertake some of those courses uh, and then head back straight to the farm. So it actually gives students a bit more flexibility. So they're actually not on campus here, you know, nine, nine to five, Monday to Friday. They can actually uh, undertake part-time study. Um, they can uh, undertake the part-time work, so or on a farm. So the students who are graduating from Lincoln University now are the best that there's ever been. That's right, because you've got, you've got students that are, that are doing uh, the work actually on a farm and they've got the students, and you've got students actually studying in here uh, what it takes to manage a farm. So I think you've got um, a student at the end of their degree uh, the, having the best of both worlds. Which of course is very good news. Straight after the break we're going to be talking to a chap who's got some of the top Holstein Friesians in the country but he doesn't sell his milk. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Not sure why your camellias aren't cooperating? Try GrowSure Planting Magic, packed full of nutrients in just one handful. Be sure with GrowSure from KiwiCare. Holstein Frisians, you've had a long history with them. Yeah, um, grew, I've grew up with them um, from, from my early days when I was uh, born in Devon back in the UK. Um, always been around the Holstein black and white. So. 
Then you moved to New Zealand. Yeah, 2000 we moved over as a family um, and um, we, we moved up to Marlborough and um, we bought a, a dairy farm up there. The UK got a bit claustrophobic? Yeah, it was quite depressing actually during the 90s. Um, I was um, left school in the mid 90s and then went to college, went to Dutchy College and did a um, up to level four agriculture and um, it was there was just no future. Um, we'd been hit by a succession of um, negative stories in the press. There was the BSE scandal and then and that was just prior to us moving out. The next thing was a foot and mouth so it, it wasn't getting any better over there that's for sure. UK dairying very intensive compared to New Zealand numbers wise. Um, yeah it, there's there's um, you get a lot of lot more farms um, where I grew up in the southwest there was there was um, it was still quite traditional in, in many ways there was um, small dairy farms but it's changed changing rapidly yeah the whole picture's changed. And now you are here on the peninsula or almost on the peninsula by Lake Ellesmere and you're doing stud breeding. Yeah yeah that, that's our that's our as a family we've we've had a love for, for breeding pedigrees um, like I say I grew up with um, Holstein um, I've always been associated with Limousin cattle as well and and, and and my wife she grew up on a on a small um, goat farm over in, in Kent so yeah we've, we've always had a, a love for the the pedigrees. Tell me about your your stock because you'd be very picky. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we was up in Marlborough, I had a it was it was basically a, a, a smallish commercial farm, but I couldn't be too picky because you you had to sort of get the milk in the vat. We had contracts to supply with town town supply with Fonterra, um, but now we've got the luxury of just being able to be really choosy. Um, I've basically in a, in a way started from scratch really, um, so we've we're very fortunate in in Canterbury in this area. We've got some of the best breeders um, right on our doorstep. Um, to name a few, we've got like Geddes's and and uh, the Stewarts as well, and then a bit further down um, with the uh, uh, Fairview. So yeah, very fortunate to have some very good breeders locally. And you're not selling the milk? No, no. Um, it's actually nice having a break from from not having that pressure of of having to meet all the criteria and the regulation. So uh, not saying that that won't ever happen again. We, I, I, I never say never to anything. But at the moment, we're just really enjoying concentrating on the breeding and um, I'm buying in lots of uh, beef cross calves and obviously rearing pedigree calves and that's that's what we're concentrating on at the moment. Ah, so that's how you pay the grocer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. Yeah, we, we downsize, so we, we've been able to come onto the farm without massive overheads and that's obviously the key to it. Um, the, the farm we had in Marlborough was, was substantial. It was about a thousand acres um, and we've come down to a, a farm here that's, we're farming about 170 acres here. So it's a lot smaller, but um, we're, we're more hands on with the stock. And are, are you yet selling any of your Holsteins? No, no, not yet. Like I say, we're still very early days. I'm just, um, like I say, very cherry picking a few. I've, I've, we brought a few from the um, over the recent years from the Canterbury Collection sale and just privately as well. Um, but um, that's not the main aim. The main aim is I'm only milking a handful. I, I, I just would like to be milking good quality cattle. That's 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 my aim. Is I don't want numbers. I just want a few that milk very well. And yeah, in the future, if we can get a good a good heifer that can uh, meet the criteria then absolutely that's a bonus. And I guess there must be some very good sires that you can buy the semen off. Yeah yeah I'm, I'm very very careful who, who I buy from we've got some excellent reps that we do with locally various different companies um, but um, yeah we, there's certain traits that I look for um, we, we want good framed cows that milk well look good um, longevity is a thing that I'm, I'm very keen on I'm not not keen on cows that produce oodles and then tail off um, in their relatively young years, so I want a cow that will do the distance, and um, and and yeah, ultimately um, the, the top the, cattle. Yeah, we, yeah, basically small small numbers, but quality. Embryo transplants. So you're looking at that? Yeah, we've already, already done some of that. Yeah, we um, we work closely with one of the the chaps who's based up in the Hawkes Bay. Um, again, because we're only small numbers, we tie in with some of the local breeders, so we tend to work around like like the Geddeses and that when they're doing doing some flushes we'll work in with them and, and um, we're always keen to get two or three in and uh, do some embryos but yeah we've got um, just behind you here we've got an embryo a uh, couple of embryo calves that were born just this year so mm. in just a moment or two we're going to be looking at the QE2 trust what it is and how it works James QE2 trust what's the history of it well, next year will be 40 years old, uh, so it was, it was actually finally gazetted in 19, 19, 1977, um, but there was a couple of years of, of preamble up to that. Uh, it was really formed by a group of pretty visionary farmers who looked around during the period where the government was encouraging land development encouragement grants, so people were knocking down bush and being, being paid to do it. Uh, and a number of farmers, um, people like 
Gordon Stevenson, who died last year, Peter Ilwazi, and Sir Thaddeus McCarthy, who was the first trust chair, said we need to start providing a mechanism for farmers so they can actually protect that, that what they've got on their land if they want to. So the trust was set up as a, as a mechanism to allow landowners to say, I've got something I want to protect, I want to look after it. How do I partner with somebody who can do that? Yeah. That's interesting if it was during a period when everybody was saying more production, more production, yeah. more production. Yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it was pretty visionary stuff. And, and, and for that reason, it's, it didn't have a lot of momentum in the early years. Um, but it, it, it uh, has been pretty successful over, you know, over the last 40 years. It has, on average, um, um, registered a trust every, uh, two trusts every week, roughly. Why QE2? Queen Elizabeth II was the time of the uh, of the Queen's 25th jubilee. So um, uh, the the background, I think, the government at the time when it when it finally ex acknowledged that it needed a trust like this for private land protection, uh, thought it would have a bit of gravitas with um, by attaching Her Majesty's name to it. Let's go right back to basics. What exactly does the trust do? Very simply, it, it partners. We 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 use a lot of p words. We we, we have we have partnerships. They're in perpetuity on private land precious places. So <laughs> forgive the alliteration, but that's effectively, so uh, the big point of difference is that we work on private land. So the 70% of New Zealand that's that's privately owned is where the trust is active, the other 30% which the Crown owns uh, and, and is managed by the Department of Conservation, we don't have any role in that. So we work with farmers and landowners, they don't always have to be farmers, a lot of the lifestyle blocks and people who own land specifically to covenant with the trust, who say, I've got something I want to protect, how do I go about doing that? So the trust then, um, puts its, its local rep onto the case and the, and the rep will have a look at the merits of it and um, will then provide the protection mechanisms um, and we go through a point of registration. At that point, the, the land will be registered on the title and um, the, that, so we're the, we're the perpetual partner in perpetuity. Forgive the peas again. Exactly. So if, if a farmer has got a piece of QE2 trust land, and we'll come to, to how they do that shortly. Yep. <clears throat> but when that farm is sold, that stays as part of the trust. That's right. It, no, it's, it's actually on the landowner's title. It's not the trusts. The trust is the partner. The trust right. ensures <clears throat> that, that, that that what it was set up to, to or, or the values that the land, the original covenanting landowner put on that land, those values are maintained. So, so we're very much driven by the original covenanter's desire, what they want, and that's part of the trust document. And once that's in place, then, then, then if it changes hands two or three times, the trust sits there as the perpetual partner. Yep, and, but you can't, the, the new landowner can't go on with the bulldozer. No, nope, cannot. That's fabulous to hear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting that you're saying that people don't give their land to the trust, people still own it. Yes, absolutely. It, so it's still it's just registered on the title as being a bit of protected land under the part, uh, with the National Trust. So we put, we've got a corner of a farm or we've got a gully that native bush, how do we go about preserving it? Uh, if you think it's got good merit, and, and, and it, it will usually be environmental, biodiversity is something we're looking for, but it could also be historical, cultural. Um, but if it, if it has merit and you think it's something precious, get in touch with the local QET National Trust representative, and there are 28 of them around the country. Uh, that person will come out, and they're, they're experts on the local ecology and local area, and they'll assess it, and if it's got good, good merit, um, they'll recommend it for protection. It then goes through a process. Uh, they will try and, and leverage as much support as they can out of other organisations like regional councils, because regional councils have responsibility in law to protect biodiversity in their regions. So quite often we will work with those those councils, and, and some are very good, some are not quite so good. But some of them are average, but some of them are very good. Some <laughs> of them are very good, and we're trying yeah. to get a bit of a national consistency uh, about that. And and they use us as the, as the covenanting partner. So they may come to the party, <coughs> excuse me, with um, with with a fencing subsidy. Uh, the trust will match the landowner's fencing contribution 50-50. So whatever they, whatever's left after after the the, um, the regional council, the trust will, will come come up with that on 50-50, uh, and the trust will pay for the survey costs. Thereafter, it still remains very much uh, in, in the landowner's um, responsibility to look after it. So, so they yep. do the weed and pest control. We and are pest. just going to say pest control is yep. pretty important. Yep. Fence maintenance, pest control, and, and weed control are still the responsibility of the landowner. The trust isn't actually funded to do that. We would like to be. We'd like to get more funding that enables us to support our, our covenanters. Um, and that's something we're working on, is trying to do that. But currently, we're funded basically to do the protective role. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, huge landowner contribution that's not recognised nationally. It runs into the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in terms of foregone opportunity and just annual, annual costs. You're looking after the fences, you're dealing with the pests, you're dealing with the weeds, um, and you're doing that in the national interest at your cost. Yeah, but it's a really good feeling. Yep, it is. There's a very good feeling about it, and, and we have some wonderful results. We have people who, uh, their farmers, who, who their, their land that they're protecting is probably <coughs> more important in some cases than the productive stuff. And as you get a bit older, you get to, to a bit of a legacy thing, and you start saying, well, this is something I want to leave behind. And we get a lot of people in retirement age saying, before I sell or before I move on, I want to protect that. I want, I want to get, come to the National Trust and, and, see, and make sure that it's going to be there in perpetuity. I'm yet to come across a farmer, James, who doesn't want to leave the land better than when he found it. Correct. You know, I mean, and that's the thing. So tell me about the fence, because does it, does it keep predators out? Does it keep deer out? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, they're supposed to be stock proof is what we're talking about, because historically we've been looking at sheep, keeping sheep and, sheep and cattle and goats out. Um, there are now some parts of the country where, where deer numbers are increasing, particularly the east coast of the North Island. Uh, coming out of forests and and so keeping deer out is actually quite important as well. So we're we're looking at other mechanisms to top up fences, uh, to provide um, you know those large ungulates. But but as much as anything, we're looking at, at dealing with the nasties, you know the the the, the mustelids, the, the rats, uh, the, the cats, and those sorts of things that are still in there killing birds. Uh, and we're dealing with some pretty nasty weed pests. Uh, and old some, man's um, beard, for old, example, old springs to mind. Old man's beard can, can, you know, can just destroy a couple of Tretiscantes and another <clears> one. There's just, a, I mean, there was a raft of them. Some, some, the further north you go, the, the worse it gets. Everything that's likely to grow will, will, will grow. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, covenanters do battle away and try pretty hard to keep their covenants in good, pristine order, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a battle. James, is there an opening there for urban people to come out and spend a day in the country and, and help out and then have a barbecue at the end of the day and go home. Well, I think that's one of the areas that I, I'd really love to see that. Um, we're not well known in, in, in urban New Zealand. Uh, most farmers know of us. Provincial areas <coughs> sort of have a brief understanding of us, but, but the major cities don't. Uh, and I think it would be a wonderful role, that, that um, a love, wonderful partnership, another form of partnership where urban people could come out and say, look, I'll spend a day with you. I'll bring my hammer, knock a few stables in, show me how to cut down the weeds, you know, maybe give you a hand to set of stoke traps or whatever else, uh, and enjoy doing something in the national good, and then also spending time with the farmer, as you say, having a barbecue and a beer at the end of the day and saying, well, it's a good job, two or three times a year. The landowner would love it. Um, the urban pe people would get some real benefits out of it. Um, we haven't developed a, a program to, to drive that yet, but that's something that I think would, would actually be uh, hugely in the national interest. I mean, I can see a family, for example, with, with children who spend all day looking at a screen and going ching, 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 and the parents saying, for God's sake, we've got to get this child out to nature somehow. Yeah. And they don't want to do the garden because they live there. And what an, what an absolute buzz to hear them, hear the birds and to see the birds and to, and to do something constructive. I mean, yeah, <laughs> and, the, and the other thing the trust does is we do monitor our covenants, <clears throat> so you can actually see the gains. You can see the, the vegetation improving. You can, you know, we we have a, our, our reps go out every second year and, and monitor the, the, the gains that it, so it actually can be quantified. So you can you can see the, the, the change in the growth and the, I suppose you can measure a bird song as well. But uh, it, it's, yeah, it, I mean, it's I, I just benefits. I take my hat off too because you know that there is. And all around the world, there are people destroying stuff. And you guys, the QE2 Trust, are, are rebuilding. So, congratulations. Well, we, I mean, 70% of New Zealand has been heavily modified. Uh, and, and we're dealing with the last bits, that the, the underrepresented, the, 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 the threatened, the, the little bits that are still left on some of those areas. And some of them are huge, actually. But, but um, you know, we, we, that's what makes this country so important. It's, 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 a, it's got a unique biodiversity that, that nowhere else in the world has, and we have a responsibility to look after that. So most landowners... We'll, we'll certainly have a production focus, but they also have, uh, I think, a very responsible focus about leaving the land better, keeping the balance. So biodiversity, it's, a, it's, a, it's an, almost an abused word, but it is about biological diversity. So it's about having native animals and native plants and, and, and those things which make New Zealand so, so different. Well, so, as I said, all power to you, Albo Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, if you like to go back over James's interview and catch up on what he was saying, you can go to our website, which is in fact ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but it will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.